world is dying. And we can change that. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind is a 1984 film that tells the story of a woman fighting against all odds to defend the only home she's ever known, the world no one else seems to care for, from two military superpowers. It is a story of triumph in the face of inexorable power, a victory won not without loss or hardship, yet won nonetheless without senseless violence. I was introduced to the films of Hayao Miyazaki at a very young age. By the time I was old enough to have memories, Spirited Away, Princess Mononoke, and especially Castle in the Sky were already go-to staples for me. By far, though, my favorite film of them all was Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. Up until now, I'd never really thought too much about why I loved it so much more than the others. I just kinda accepted that I did. Now that Mikey Newman started Lessons Animation Taught Us, I finally got an excuse to dive into this head first. In looking back upon and trying to analyze films I watched as a kid, I regularly run into the same issue. The differences between the interpretations I made when I was a child and those that I make now don't present themselves in any sort of clear way, since I wasn't exactly documenting the evolution of my personal analysis of the Tigger movie while I was still too young to ride in a car without a booster seat. Somehow, though, it's different with Nausicaa. The reason for this is twofold. For one, Miyazaki's personal ethos is more apparent in this film than any other work of his, even more so than Princess Mononoke and Ponyo, to the degree that its heavily Shintoistic themes are explicitly clear to even the youngest of viewers, although the English localization did anglicize a lot of that, with the only real changes over time being the ever-increasing ability of the audience to apply those themes of environmentalism and reconciliation to their own lives as they age. On the other hand, I personally went through a massive change, which I'll get into later, near the end of high school that gave me an immense amount of insight into why my younger self found one specific aspect of the film to be more impactful than the rest of it. Let's start with the first thing for now. In 1951, a factory run by the Chiso Corporation in the small Japanese town of Minamata changed the chemical catalyst used in their production of acetaldehyde, a change which facilitated the creation of methylmercury as the microbiota of Minamata Bay interacted with the chemical wastewater dumped into it. Methylmercury just so happens to be an organic compound containing one of the most toxic elemental substances known to mankind, and it was rapidly bioaccumulating within the ecosystem, poisoning its inhabitants. Crows fell from the sky, stray cats went mad, and deformed fish died in massive numbers. In 1956, there was an outbreak of Minamata disease, which we now know to be mercury poisoning. When the cause of the affliction was discovered in November of 1959, Hayao Miyazaki was just starting his first year of university. By the time he was approached by Toshio Suzuki to produce a manga for the magazine Animage, the Chiso Corporation had entered litigation for its third set of Minamata disease lawsuits. It's not hard to see where a lot of the inspiration for the world of Nausicaa came from. The entire story is centered around the lasting pernicious effects of industrial pollution on the Earth and its creatures, and it ends with Nausicaa using the only surviving god warrior to destroy the last remaining vestiges of industrial technology. Throughout the narrative, Miyazaki is unequivocally cognizant of the destruction that must be wrought in order to undo the mistakes of our past, and the manga is no stranger to death and pain, and serves more as a warning of what may yet befall us than a story of hope and triumph over evil. The movie version takes that theme and absolutely runs with it. Since it's only two hours though, a lot of the story in action ended up having to be cut. That's not to say that nothing violent happens though, it's about a war, and death and combat are readily apparent. The conflict starts with Lestelle dying of a massive chest wound after being thrown out of an airship in a fiery crash, followed by Nausicaa's dad getting murdered in cold blood and her bludgeoning four people to death. You've also got Aspel shooting down four airships with almost no survivors, a military that destroyed its own city with what is essentially an insect-based biological terror attack, a super deadly shipboarding with a ton of visible murders, Nausicaa Nausicaa getting shot by a machine gun and then having her fresh gunshot wound dipped into acid, a gross looking god warrior blowing up thousands of ohms with a nuke laser before melting like bad fondue, and Nausicaa getting yeeted into space by a charging herd of giant bugs that, need I remind you, destroyed an entire city earlier. All of that violence serves a purpose though. It's not like the kind we see in a lot of modern action films where thousands of people are killed in a city leveling superhero punch out. Here, the violence is not only realistic but visceral and personal. The first major fight of the movie immediately draws attention to how awful and destructive war can be as Nausicaa ends up stabbing her own mentor in a rage and passing out as she sees him bleed. Given how staunchly anti-war Miyazaki is, the man skipped accepting an Oscar for Spirited Away to protest the Iraq war. Him making a point to show the brutality of war is no surprise at all. Alongside the message of peace, Miyazaki's environmentalist sentiments shine through as well. Nausicaa comes face to face with man-eating bugs and instead of fighting them, she calms them down with a tiny little worm flute and she's so in touch with nature that she telepathically communes with giant death beetles. 
The crux of the film is that the only sustainable way to live is to be in harmony with nature because ultimately, nature is more powerful than we are and we owe it to the Earth to treat it well. This aspect of the movie was incredibly comforting to me as a kid. I grew up in the Great Smoky Mountains in the mid-2000s, during which time the woolly adelgid, an invasive insect species, destroyed hundreds of thousands of eastern hemlocks and fraser firs, leaving the mountains covered in massive swaths of dead and dying trees. Watching the life get leached out of the land around me was super depressing, and Nausicaa was the only thing that gave me any sense of solace as the luscious green of the Smoky Mountains was steadily replaced by an ever-growing graveyard of deathly white bare skeletons in the place of the trees that used to flourish there. In Nausicaa, humanity all but obliterated life on Earth with bio-nuclear god warriors, and Earth responded by creating the toxic jungle, a poisonous sea of noxious plants that breeds within itself colossal, nigh-unstoppable insects that serve to protect the land they come from. The jungle isn't just deadly, though. In truth, it's quite the opposite. It's discovered by Nausicaa that the toxicity is a result of the jungle purifying the soil. The land is, slowly but surely, actively reversing the damage that mankind has done to it. And guess what? The same thing, well, a similar thing, there weren't any giant bugs, ended up happening in the Smoky Mountains. Those trees are still dead, but new ones sprung up in their place, and everything is green again. As a kid, knowing that things weren't just gonna suck forever, that they eventually do end up getting better if you just wait to see it happen, was incredibly comforting. That's the third main theme of this movie, not giving up. I know that's really corny, but just hear me out, okay? Nausicaa's dad is assassinated while her home is occupied by a hostile military, and she gets stranded in the middle of a death forest, taken as a political prisoner, shot with a machine gun, and dipped in acid. Despite all of that, she keeps moving forward, ultimately directly placing herself in the path of the charging homes that she knows will almost certainly kill her because she desperately wants to return their baby to them and right the wrongs her fellow humans have caused. Her perseverance is unwavering, and that's what ultimately stops the senseless violence. Miyazaki doesn't just use the film to express his sentiment that war is a bad thing, he presents a solution. Stand your ground, no matter what, and you can make a difference. This is, fundamentally, a hopeful story. There's no shortage of death and suffering in the film, and yet, through all of that, Miyazaki somehow managed to spin a tale in which someone saves the planet by being a genuinely good person. Mikey Newman wasn't wrong when he said, How Miyazaki is who the term unrivaled was invented for. Part of why that duality of unyielding hope amongst abject suffering is so unique here is the fact that the stakes are real in a way that is tangible on a personal level. The stakes at play are gargantuan, and it's not the violence that tells you that, it's the characters. You're told in no uncertain terms that the situation at hand needs to be rectified, but instead of expressing this through the mass murder of scores of innocent people, Miyazaki drives the point home by making the most likable characters in the film so emphatically opposed to needless bloodshed that in order to stop it, they repeatedly throw themselves into harm's way. The voice acting drives this aspect home even further, Alison Lohman yelling, STOP IT! ALL THIS KILLING MUST STOP! is one of the most impassioned lines I've ever heard in a film, and she's that emotive throughout the entire movie, even in the scenes where she's just chilling out all cozy by the fireplace. And every single cast member pulls off a performance of that caliber. It's ridiculous. Speaking of those voice actors, let's talk about the English version. It kind of trampled all over the Shintoistic overtones of the original film, but it still taught me a really important lesson as a kid in spite of that. Personally, this ending didn't tell me that I could single-handedly save the world if I put my mind to it, but what it did teach me was even more valuable. It's okay to defy expectations. As a child, I didn't really have the language to describe everything I was experiencing. Especially as I got older and things in my life started to change, I really lacked the vocabulary to elucidate what I was going through, but I kept coming back to Nausicaa. It wasn't until I was 16 that I finally learned why this film was so important to me, but for over a decade and a half, I had been consistently enthralled by a story in which everyone thinks for the entire narrative that a character is going to be a man, but end up taking it completely in stride when they discover that the person it ended up being was a woman. I grew up in a really rural area, so I didn't even know the word transgender until Caitlyn Jenner came out. This movie was indispensable to my development as a trans person because it gave me hope that everything would turn out okay. And yeah, this interpretation of mine was only really possible due to the fact that the English version specifically gendered the person in the prophecy, but that inaccuracy is specifically what taught Lil' Sarah that life was going to be okay, no matter how out of place I felt at the time. The whole point of Lessons Animation Taught Us is to share our personal stories of what our favorite animated movies imparted upon us when we were children. And I'd say that subconsciously learning that I was trans, and that that was okay, was a pretty damn important lesson for me. Don't go away yet! 
I just gotta get through the platitudes, and then we'll be back to the interesting bits, okay? There's some stuff I had to cut from the main video. We'll get to that. Just give me a second. Uh, first, please give the video a like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to see more long-form content like this, and leave a comment letting me know what you thought. If you know someone who would like this, please share it with them. Also, huge thanks to Adrian, Emily, and Ghost Eye for their help with the script. They gave me a lot of feedback for this video, and it wouldn't have turned out as well as it did without their help. Okay, now that the shameless plugs are over, here's the stuff I had to cut. So, the original English release of Nausicaa came out in 1985 as Warriors of the Wind, which is so awful in so many ways. Uh, they removed 23 whole minutes of content, they straight up forgot to cut out the original Japanese dub at points, uh, they sped up a lot of the action scenes because I guess they thought it's more kid-friendly if people get stabbed at one and a half speed? I don't really understand that one. Uh, they changed just about everything's name. A spirited princess named Zandra. Uncle Yabba. A fire demon. Axel. Temeculans. Her Royal Highness Queen Selina. The country of Placida. What? Along with a lot of, uh, you know, creative voice acting. I don't think you're as evil as you pretend to be, Queen Selina. Ah, <laughs> but I am. We've landed in a nest of giant gorgons. Well, we're surrounded by them. And for some reason, Nausicaa, oh, sorry, Zandra, and the people of the valley, they're all southern. They all have southern accents. Doesn't make much sense. It's like a fever dream, I swear. Also, I sadly wasn't able to go in-depth when it came to the Shintoistic aspects of the film, so if you want to know more about that in general, Wisecrack has a pretty good video up on their channel about Shintoism and Miyazaki, and if you want to know more about how the 2005 English localization from Disney specifically messed up some of those aspects, check out Eriko Okihara Shuk's chapter from the book Graven Images, Religion in Comic Books and Graphic Novels. I linked an academia.edu page in the description which has it as a PDF. Anyways, that's all I've got for now. Have a nice day, and sit up straight in your chair. It's better for your back.